Okay, let's begin with chapter 6 on the textbook. Uh, in this chapter, the lamp loses 6 of the 7 seals on the scroll. The first 4 seals reveal 4 horses and their riders. Commonly referred today as the 4 horsemen of the apocalypse. But there's what is said about different riders. Very interesting. I want you to underline that. A crown was given to him, the rider on the white horse. It was granted on the one there was given to him, the rider on the red horse, a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, the rider on the bl uh, black horse, power was given to them, rider on a pale horse, death and death. Who had the power to give a crown to grant its authority? Who in the midst of the four living creatures that might have spoken, who had power to give death and has this. When we consider that Jesus is the ruler of the king of the earth, that he has the keys of the ass and of the dead, that he was in the midst of the four living creatures, it seems clear that the answer is Christ. In other words, the horses and their rider were acting upon the authority and power given them by Christ. Therefore, I suggest the following minister of the first four seed. So let's go point by point. Uh, this is chapter 5. Yeah, yeah, it's only chapter 6. Yeah. I know it's already chapter 5, it's already done yesterday. If yesterday we do class. Huh? If we yesterday. Yeah, we have done already. Five. No, yeah, that yeah. 5 is already done. Okay, now. Uh, up to 4 only. Up to 4 only we've done? Okay. Yeah. Okay, then let's go to the chapter 5 then. Okay, then why did you say uh, uh, 6? Okay, chapter 5, you can open a page to the party too. Okay, let's see on the chapter uh, 5. The scene that begins in chapter 4 continues. Where the themes of the four can be said, God is on his throne, the themes of his scepter by maybe called worthy is the lamb. John attention is drawn to the scroll in the right hand of God, written on the inside of the black. It is sealed with the seven seals as a strong hand to proclaim who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals. At first there seems to be a knock in heaven on earth, deep worthy to open the scroll or look at it. This prompted John to weep. Now one of the twenty-four elders tell him not to weep. For one described as the light of the tribe of Judah, who is the good of David, has prevailed, so to be able to open the scroll and lose its seals. Lord sees a lamb standing as those lambs with seven horns and with seven eyes. The seven eyes are explained as the seven spirit of God sent into all the earth. As suggested before, they represent the Holy Spirit, while the seven hordes are indicative of great strength. The Lamb is then seen as taking the scroll out of God's right hand, taking the scroll from the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders who fall down before the Lamb. It possesses a harp, perhaps a blinding praise, a golden bowl of incense which depict the prayer of the saints. They sing a new song, praising the Lamb as would you take the scroll. They proclaim his worthiness on the basis of being slain and redeeming his blood. Uh, those from every nation who are made kings and priests unto God who send reign on earth. The voices of thousands of angels around the throne that join with their praise of the Lamb who was slain as what he received power, riches, strength, honor, glory, blessing. Finally, every creature in heaven, earth, and sea join with praise. Before him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, who with the four living creatures says, Amen. And the 24 elders fall down and worship. This awesome scene should certainly bring the faithful Christian, as stated by Ray Summer. 
You get rid of the text. So what do the scroll reveal? <clears throat> I believe it builds God's righteous indications upon those who rejected uh, his Christ and persecuted his people. Also, how his suffering saints will eventually overcome as long as the scrolls are sealed and working of God was still a mystery. But as the seals are broken, we have the revelation of Jesus Christ who gave him to so his servant the things which are sought to take place. Now there are many things to learn but uh, from the textbook this is just a survey and a guideline. But I prefer to stick with the Bible itself, okay? Because we often say that the Bible is the textbook. Okay, we would like to use it as a textbook so that uh, not depending on the notes uh, that much. I think depending and relying on the scripture is far more important than relying on any commentaries or relying on any other resources. First of all, let's see on the, the scripture itself and let's try to understand, analyze it one by one. First of all, I want to emphasize on I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. First of all, let's understand the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Number one. Now, in the Bible, whenever you come across the word right hand, please keep in mind that right hands are always symbolic. Okay? These are not literal. You cannot apply a literal physical interpretation with regards to God's right hand. We know that God of the Spirit, as such, he does not have a left hand and right hand unless the God chooses to manifest in some human form or in the human body. Now remember, today we have a human body, but once we die, when we are in the spirit, we will no longer possess even this body at all. So therefore, we will not have a left hand and right hand. These are no more necessary, okay? Because the spirit does not have a left hand and right hand, or arms or head or toe or even legs or, you know, so-called body. <coughs> So unless and until that God is manifested in the flesh, in a human form, we know that he does not have a left hand and right hand. So what does the left hand and right hand symbolize? Well, the right hand of God always symbolizes God's righteousness, God's holiness, and God's glory. Now remember, the right hand of God always symbolizes God's power. In short, okay, the right hand of God always symbolizes power of God. Okay? That's what it means. That, so the right hand of God always emphasizes the power of God. Okay? It does not mean uh, that God has a physical right hand. So here it says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne of, uh, and then of him that sat on the throne. Now Revelation, it's coming back again. Now remember, scriptures will always interpret the scriptures. So if you look at in the, you know, uh, Revelation chapter 4 verse 8, who is the one that sat on the throne? The one who sat on the throne is Jesus Christ himself. Because the 24 elders and the four beasts. Now we have we already explained the four beasts. Okay, refers to the four gospels. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Zohar. Okay? Now the 24 elders refer to the 12 tribe of Israelites. And then the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. So if you combine it, then you have 24 elders. Okay, so the four gospel here symbolized again or refers to the four gospels. So without resting their nights, they cried out unto him and said unto the worship him, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, if you look at the Bible, you can clearly see the one who sat on the one throne in heaven is Jesus Christ alone. And also Revelation the four verse 2 says, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And how many sat on the throne? One or two. One sat on the throne. Now some other person says, There is one set, one throne in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay, so when you study again religion the four verse eight, you can understand the one who sat on the one throne is none other but Jesus Christ himself. So now, therefore, don't be confused. 
Okay? So the one who sat on the throne is our Lord Jesus Christ. Written within and on the bedside, sealed with the seven seals. Now, here is something very important to understand. What is the seventh seal? I think that is the main focus of this chapter 5. Understanding the seventh seal in this, this first section is very important. Because of this, John is weeping. He cried out because he found nobody worthy to unloose that seventh seal. Okay? Uh, in our language, we say, Sin Hana Pastari. How does you say uh, seven seal in your language? Okay? Pastari. Seven means uh, seven. So, seal means how would you say? Seven seals. How does he say it in your Bible? Let's check it out. The reason is why. Uh, verse 1. Read up. How does he say there? Does what? Does what? Seven. 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 Huh? Does what? Pastori. Does what? Pastori. Okay, that is seven seal. Sin Hana Pastori. Okay, that's how it says it. Also in my language, we call it Sin Hana. Okay, that is the seals. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now the seventh seal is the main, I think, uh, emphasis in this section was. Because if you look down here in verse 2, John is saying, I saw strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book? Okay. So John is saying that I saw a strong angel proclaiming, saying, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seventh seal thereof. Now verse 3 is a very important. No man in heaven, nor in the earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. That means in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, there is nobody who can lose the seven seals. There is none in heaven, and nobody is there on earth, and nobody is there obviously under the earth who can lose the seven seals. Clear now. And because of this, okay, now because of this, the section one deals with this in verse 4. Because of this, Zon. Now, clarified and he said in verse 4, and John is saying, and because of that, God said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, that means, let's say this is the book. Okay, for your understanding. Now, this book is sealed with the seven seals. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Okay, there is a seal over here. One seal, two seals, three seals, four, five, six, seven. Now, nobody is found worthy in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. No one has the power to unloose the seven seal. Let's say if this book has been a seal that with a seal, or if it is a okay bound with, let's say. Even with this uh, scuff, okay, or even with this piece of clothes, that nobody is worthy to open because it has been sealed. Okay, now let's say this is the book. So, in that imaginary form, in that visualization, Zohar has seen a kind of a book which has been sealed with the seven seals. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then Zohar clarified that nobody is worthy to happen. On earth and under the earth, there is no one who has the power to lose that seven seals. And now in verse 4, because of that, John said, I wept much. In other words, I cried literally. Because John said, now I started crying because I found nobody's worthy in heaven, on earth and under the earth, who can lose that seven seals and open the book. Now, first of all, let's talk about... <coughs> What is the seventh seal? Okay, understanding the seventh seal is a very, very important. 
What does it mean by these seven seals? Okay, very importantly, uh, most of the people may not, uh, you know, clarify everything in details, but it is important for us to ask these questions. Okay, these questions is this. What is the seven seals? What does it symbolize? But one thing we are certain that this seal is not a physical, uh, a literal seals. Okay? I know that this is not a physical seals. I'm made of some, uh, you know, with some uh, chemicals, uh, you know, materials or something. It's not made of any other chemicals or something. It's not made of some other liquid forms. Okay, we know that according to the Bible, it's not a physical seals. Okay, it's not a physical seals, not made of rubber or not made of a steel or something. We know that this seal is a symbolic. But what we need to understand is what does this seals really symbolize? I think that's a very important pivotal question. What does it really symbolize? And what is this a seven seals? Number one, the seven seal here symbolize the law of Moses. Or you can say the Sabbath law. I repeat myself for your understanding. The seventh seal here symbolize the law and the Sabbath. Okay? Now when you say the Sabbath, the Sabbath is, what does the Sabbath mean? It means the seventh day. Okay, God created the heavens and the earth and even the man on the sixth day. On the sixth day, God made man on his own image, and uh, on the seventh day, he rested. So there were number seven is also the number of God. And uh, what does it mean by the number seven? The number seven uh, means God perfection, God holiness, and God's, okay, it also symbolizes or refers to God's perfection and God's greatness. So number seven is always a number of God, as far as the Old Testament are concerned. For example, God rested on the seventh day, and therefore Naaman was instructed by the Elisa to go to the Jordan River and give himself into that water how many times? Seven. Seven times again. All right? And then we know that even the Jericho, the city Jericho was circles by the Israelite how many times? Seven times they circles. And then what did they do? They blow the trumpet and one accord and Jericho was fallen. Now remember, if you look at the Bible, we can see that seven is always a God's number. Okay, therefore, even Revelation it says there isn't the five or six days, seven spirits. Revelation chapter three, verse one talks about the seven spirits again. And we know that even that seven spirit does not mean that God is a seven persons or in the Godhead there are seven gods, but we understand the seven spirit mean it is referring to the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, or referring to the Holy Spirit. And we know the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Okay? So therefore it's very important. So the seventh seal here symbolize the law of Moses or the Sabbath law. And now the second thing that we need to solve over here is, then what about the book? And I know that none of you have studied this way of exposition in your, in your entire life. Have you ever studied like this before? Have you ever studied in any Bible school? No, my friend, because normally we study only survey. We study a little bit about the Bible background and it refers to, you know, this book, that book, that commentary, that commentary. And every night at 6 p.m., we go to the library. Whether we like it or not, we spend another two hours, three hours sitting in the library and we, are, we don't know what we're reading. Okay, it becomes a ritual, it's part of a, you know, part of that hostel lives. So we, we are we are assigned to go to the library and we just read it, uh, some uh, you know Western book, some theological book, some theological book, and we don't exactly know what it, what it's all about because most of you don't even understand the, even the vocabulary, you don't even understand even the meaning. But we spend our three hours of training and we graduate after four years of training, three years of training, and we say we hold the you know, the bachelor degrees in theology. But once we graduate, we know nothing about Revelation. And therefore, our knowledge, the knowledge of most of these so-called our graduate today, most of our pastors today in our prison churches, the knowledge level is very, very um, not to that level. Okay? 
most of our people don't have any knowledge about the Guru Revelation at all. And this is a scary thing. And uh, some preachers have failed to say that do not learn Revelation and the Son of Solomon, okay, in the Sunday school. <coughs> but the most important book is the Revelation and the Son of Solomon. Because if you understand all these uh, you know, spiritual languages, the you know, metaphors and symbolism, then you can understand the God's secrets. You can understand what God is passing the message to you and I. Now let's talk about other book. What is this book? And we know that this book is not an ordinary book. One thing is clear. Now this book does not mean uh, a book like this. Okay, this, it does not mean okay a physical book. One thing is clear. And John said, this book has been sealed with the seven seals. And he said, I found that no one is born in heaven on earth and under the earth. No one has the power to unloose that seven seal. And therefore I wept. Therefore I cried bitterly. That's what he said. So now we have already solved one problem that is a seven seal actually refers to the Sabbath. Okay, the law of Moses. Or the Old Testament law, okay? Uh, the law of Moses. Now, then what does it mean by the book? Now remember this is symbolism. But behind this symbolism, behind this, all these spiritual languages, God is conveying a message to you and me. God wants you to have a clear message from him so that we can understand his confidence, so that we can understand his truth. So that we can understand his words. So now let's create this one. The first one has been already correct. What is that? Seal. The seal symbolizes or refers to the covenant or the Sabbath. Then now, what about the book? And why would John uh, wept much? Why would he cry bitterly? Why would he be weeping so profusely? Okay. Why would he cry literally, saying that? I wept much because I found no one worthy in heaven and earth and under, earth, under the earth to lose the seventh seal. Now, if that book is an ordinary book, then I'm sure that John will not be weeping. But there is, John did not disclose it in detail. John did not say anything in details why he wept, but there must be a reason behind he wept because he knows the value of that book. Because he know that book is not an ordinary book, okay? If it is an ordinary book, then why would you wear it? Because that book is not your, not your mom, that's not your father, that's not your grandfather and mother, right? So just because one book is being sealed with the seven seals, why would you wear If that book is simply an ordinary book, clear now? So that means, if he wear, that means there is a reason behind. He wept it because he found no one worthy in heaven and no one on earth and no one is worthy to open the book and lose the seven seals even under the earth. That means in the entire universe, no one is worthy to open that book. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray again. So now the next question here is, what does that book really symbolize? I know it's a symbolic. I know this is full of symbolism, but what does that book really symbolize? I think that's a big question that we need to answer. Now let me make it very simple, so and simple for you to understand. Here the book refers to human. Amen. Okay, what did I just say? The book here refers to, it's a referring to the human being. Okay, a reference to the people, the nations, the tongues and languages. And why the book of Revelation compared this book with the nations, people and languages? What is the reason behind? Now remember for your understanding, let me explain in a very simple way. For example, let's say, if I ask you what is this, I don't know you will say it's a book. You're right. And what is the purpose of this book? The purpose of this book is to note it down, to write it down, the sermons, to jot it down your thoughts, your ideas. Suppose if you have uh, 
a diary book, okay? How many of you used diary book before? I guess you have a diary book, right? So in a diary book, you will always go down and you will always write it down. The telephone number, your friend's number, their address, and also about your thoughts, about your day, and some of the, you will summarize it about the, the event, suppose today's event, about since morning what you have done, since morning to evening, what, what you were doing, and to whom you chat, and how God has led you, maybe you will write it down on your diary book. So usually, okay, book is useful for writing it down. Now, but under the New Testament, we understand that God said, you know, in what place? I'm going to ask you that. In what place that God said, it's been repeated in the Old Testament. Sorry, it's, it's there said in the Old Testament, but now repeated in the New Testament. Now, that prophecy is, was given on the Old Testament, but it is already fulfilled from the day of Pentecost. In one place, there is a scripture, friend, which says, that in the Old Testament, Moses wrote on the tablets. Okay, God wrote, God gave the law <coughs> to the people of Israel when in the Mount Sinai and with the finger of God on the two tablets, right? Upon the two tablets, which is written with the finger of God. Amen. So called the Ten Commandments was written with the what? God's own finger. Amen. It was not written down by Moses. Moses received the tablet from the Lord. Let's say this is the tablet, and suddenly he sees written down everything. Amen. And that is first, second, third, fourth, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now that is called the Ten Commandment. Thou shalt love your God with all your heart, with all your mind. That's a part of the Ten Commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit your Neighbor's wife, for example, thou shalt not <coughs> do this and that, okay, everything, and thou shalt keep the Sabbath, all right, etc. Now, everything is part of the Ten Commandment, right? It's written down with the finger of God, but it's written in on the two tablet. Now, this tablet means a two stones, just like a you know, a tomb stones, all right? <coughs> it's written down there, and Moses brought that two tablets. And declare to the children of Israel that this is the law of God, which is known as the Ten Commandment. Now, but somewhere in the scripture it says that God gave the law to the people of Israel and written down his laws on the tablets, on the stones. But in the last day, God said, I will no longer use those tablets, I will no longer use those stones to inscribe my law, but I will write it down everything on your heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Come across that? Okay, let's find out where the scripture refers. And where is that? Okay? Tell me where the scripture refers. Let's see in the Hebrews. So therefore understand this is a very interesting because, alright, unlike that how God gave the law to the people of Israel in the Old Testament, now the time has finally come that God said, I will no longer Amen. Write on the tablets of the stones, but I will write it on the tablets of your heart. Okay? And that is exactly what we need to uh, study over here. <coughs> so let's see here. Okay, now let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 8, everyone through the Bible. And you can circle it and you can mark it with your uh, marker so that you can memorize it, you can note it, okay? Just uh, to highlight it, the Hebrews chapter 8. And uh, all of you can start reading together Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, verse 9 and verse 10, can we read together? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9 and 10. But according to the covenant that I met with your fathers in the day 
when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not saying the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Amen. Everybody in line that verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they sell it to me, my people. Amen. See that? In the Old Testament, what did God use? He used the, the two tablets. He used the stones. As Paul also mentioned very clearly, including in 2 Corinthians. You can turn again to 2 Corinthians. All right, see chapter, uh, chapter uh, 3 and verse 7. He said, but if the ministrations of death written and engraven in stones. But then here, Apostle Paul calls it. That including the Ten Commandments or the law of Moses, the Sabbath law, according to Paul, it is nothing but it is the ministrations of that that was written and engraven in stone. But in that time, it was indeed glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for. The glory of his country, of his glory, was to be done away. How shall not the ministrations of the Spirit be rather glorious? All right, Paul goes on to say, For if the ministrations of condemnation be glory, much more do the ministrations of righteousness exceed in glory. Now that means, in the second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, Paul is contrasting between the two covenants. You can say the law and the law of the Spirit. Hallelujah. But under the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, okay, we know that God used that graven stones. He used the stones, okay, to inscribe his law, okay, which is not in the Ten Commandments. And God gave his law to the people of Israel at the Mount Sinai. Hallelujah. But God has already declared it from the Old Testament. Through the saints that God has declared, I will no longer use that anymore. As Paul said, it is nothing but administration of that, it is the administration of the nation, and therefore, okay, that God declared it like this, and God testified and said that I will no longer, I mean, use that, but instead I will make my covenant with the people of Israel in this way. And therefore, for this is the covenant that I will make, God said, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart. Amen. But in the Old Testament, he used what? He used the stones, the tablet to write, the Ten Commandments with his finger. Amen. But God said, now I will write them in their heart. Amen. Now, therefore, in the book of Revelation, Amen, the people and the nations are known as the book, Amen. Because the book is usually used for writing, Amen. Okay? For example, we have a diary book, and that is not for fashion, that is not for decoration at all. And I know that none of you use a diary book for decoration, right? You would surely use that book for writing, your thoughts, your ideas, that's your diary. Now, when you study the class 12 in uh, English uh, honors or English master, I guess, any friend, the history of any friend. In olden days, uh, 
during the 1940s, during the Second World War time, and no one has a so-called computer, there's no computer, there's no a telephone, or there's no so-called uh, a mobile phone, or uh, a voice recorder, tape recorder was not there. So obviously he used, he used a diary book. So any friend wrote it down, okay, about our story, how they escaped from the hands of the, the you know, the ruthless Hitler, the dictator of the German Nazi, and then they came to the Poland and hide there for more than a year. But finally, any friends and their family were discovered by the German army that they were hiding on the roof. They were hiding on the first floor of that building. Finally, they were put into the detection camp. And uh, mercilessly, after with, with uh, giving us such kind of merciless treatment, finally, any friends and her friends, they died. But after her death, the any friends, the diary book, was discovered by her father, and it was finally printed out. And therefore, we come to know the whole, okay? Come to know about the story of the any friends and the family, how they hide and escape from the ruthless, the German dictator Hitler. And then, when that book, when the diary book was, uh, you know, printed out in a book form, the any friend book or that diary book was actually she has written down with her own finger with a pen on the diary book, okay? About her thoughts, about Hitler, about her love for her families. She's not even a marriage, she's just such a young, beautiful girl. And it really touched the hearts of the people worldwide. So the any friend books become a certain, you know. A demanding book that worldwide more than two billions of copies were sold or within a month and therefore even today in a Christian uh, English literature when you study in a for example in your uh, 10 plus 2 or maybe in your BA uh, English course you will study about it any friend how many have heard about any friend have you heard about any friend you heard about that I think you studied right yeah so the any friend recorded everything on her diary book see so you see that, my friend, that book. Now John said, I wept because the book was sealed with a sudden seal. And nobody is able to open that book. What does it mean? And John goes on to say that no one is worthy to open the book in heaven as well as on earth and under the earth. That means in the entire universe, there is nobody worthy to open the book and to lose the seven seals. Now, even to look at that book also like this. Nobody is worthy. What does it mean? It simply means that on earth, even heaven or under the earth, nobody can, amen, give salvation, amen, to the mankind, and nobody can give you salvation in heaven on earth and not there, there is nobody who is worthy enough to lose the seventh seal. That means to destroy, amen, and to end the old covenant and start the new covenant. That's what it means. So now, let's say the book has been sealed with the seventh seal, which means as long as the book was sealed with the seventh seal, there will be no salvation. I already said, stated before, the seven seal symbolize the old covenant. The seven seal symbolize the law of Moses. So as long as if the law of Moses continue to exist, if the law of Moses continue to exist, then there will be no salvation, my dear. Because under the law of Moses, under the old covenant, under the law of Sabbath, there is no salvation. Now, then you may be asking, that, sir, what is the purpose of the law then? You want to know what the purpose of the law? Read it up. Read Galatians chapter 3. Let's see what does it say there. Galatians chapter 3. Okay, start reading from verse 21. Okay, and continue to read up to verse 24. And you will have an idea what was actually the purpose of the law of Moses. Now, if the law cannot give redemption, if the law cannot give salvation to anyone, 
then what was the purpose of the law then? Let's take it out. What does the scripture say? Okay. Galatians chapter 3 and the verse 21 to 24. I think you will have an idea now. What was the purpose of the law of Moses? Now, let me repeat again to your understanding. If the law of Moses does not serve you and give you salvation, and if it does not impart salvation, then what was the purpose of the law all about? What was the law needed? Okay, let's find out what was the purpose of the law. Let's hear it. Okay, start reading. <clears throat> Anyone can read? Yeah. What does it say there? Galatians 3 21 to 24. Is the law then again not promised to us? Read now. For why? For is there has been a law given which could have given life, whereas the righteousness should have been by the law. Continue reading up the verse of the scripture has uh, concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ may be given to them that believe. Okay, our sister Lulu, you're going to read 23, 24. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should until was due to will. 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That we might be justified by law. No. What is it? That we might be justified by faith. So the purpose of the law, and if the if the law does not serve you salvation, if the law of Moses, the Sabbath law, does not serve you redemption, salvation, then why did God give the law, the Sabbath, and the law of Moses to the people of Israel? Why did he give them? Okay, now let me put it this way in our language. Sabat da tule, Moses da tutun, san dam na apek teilo tun, eng wangit Israel hongye na tun, kan patiyan tun eng wangit da tutun apek le. Okay, why you give them? If it does not serve redemption, okay, there is no redemption, no salvation through the law of Moses and the law of the Sabbath, then why did God gave to the house of Israel the law? Of Moses and the Sabbath. What was the purpose all about it? If it does not serve them and give them salvation, what is the purpose? So now Apostle John has already testified, he has already declared, and he has already revealed it fully what was the purpose of the law of Moses. And he said it this way He said, starting with verse 21, is the law then again the promise of God? He said, no, God forbid. For if there had been a law given which would have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. In verse 22, he goes on to say, But the scripture had concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 23, but before faith came, Rinna Aruhenma Tuan. Okay, before faith came. We were kept under the law. Rinna lenma tuan da noya sabat noya kan da kani. Set up unto the faith which should after will be revealed. Now verse 34. Wherefore, the law, da tutu, okay, was our schoolmaster. Da tutu Krista hena min kai fui tu ati. The schoolmaster to where? Bring us to where? Bring us to Christ. Hallelujah. So therefore, the purpose of the law, the purpose of the law of the Sabbath and the law of Moses is to bring the people unto who? Unto Christ. That we might be justified. Now the word justified here means to declare righteous. Okay, keep in mind as a Bible student, justification means to declare, okay, no, no. Justification means to declare righteous. That's the meaning. Sanctification means to set apart. Okay, keep in mind. Now, when I say sanctify or sanctification, that means to set apart. Now, justification means to declare 
to righteous as if you have never sinned. You have, you have no, uh, you have, uh, you know, sin. Okay, because God has declared you righteous. That's the meaning of justification. Now, so that we may be justified, okay, that we might be justified by what? By faith, not by the law. Amen. So that was the purpose behind it. God gave the law of Moses or the Sabbath law to the house of Israel, which means as long as Okay, that the seven seals were there. As long as the law of Moses were there, people cannot receive salvation. Forget about the Gentile. Even the house of Israel, even the people of Israel cannot receive redemption and salvation. Forget about the Gentile. Gentile starts from Edo. Even Judah the Tanfa, Israel the Tanfa, because the Bible said, no one is justified by the law. Now let's read again Galatians chapter 3. Take it on Galatians chapter 3 again. And uh, see here in verse 11, you may underline that. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11 which says, That no man is justified... That no man is justified, that means to <coughs> declare righteous, or no man can be declared righteous because the word justification means to declare righteous. Okay? So Galatians 3 verse 11 said that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That means even if you circumcise 24 by 7, even if you keep all the rituals and all the Sabbaths, all the festivals, okay? Even if you're circumcised on the eighth day, and even if you keep all the Sabbath law from your childhood until you die, all right, in your whole life, even if you keep the law more faithfully from the depth of your heart, and even if you keep it faithfully and honestly, still you will not get justification. Why? Because the scriptures say that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just to live by faith. Amen. That means it is only through faith that we can be justified. And no man, including the house of Israel, including the Israelites, cannot redeem. All right, even if they keep all the law of Moses. Then you may be asking, what was the purpose of the law then? The purpose of the law was to bring the people to Christ. That's it. So that before faith came, we were kept under the law. And in the very purpose of the law was to bring the people to Christ. So as long as there is law exists, if the law continue to exist, if the law of Moses continue to exist, then there will be no salvation, even for the Old Testament saints, including our patriarchs, our fathers like Abraham, Moses. Okay, like Samuel, like Daniel, <clears throat> including all the prophets of God, including like Solomon, David, every one of them, including Moses himself, none of them will be saved, and nobody can go to heaven. Amen. Nobody can have redemption. And therefore, if you look at the Hebrews chapter 11, it says the heroes of the faith, starting from the Adam. <coughs> Noah, Abraham, and all the heroes in the Old Testament, none were saved by the law, but they were all saved by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's it, Amen. You see that? Now let's just have a look at there in Hebrews 11, for example. <clears throat> Check it out in Hebrews chapter 11 for your understanding. Now, what is a faith? Okay, somebody asks you, what is faith, by the way? You don't have to say, I don't know, I think, I think uh, faith is this and that. You don't have to say that, okay? If someone asks you, what is faith? Answer is verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 is your answer. What is faith? Read on. No, no, what is faith? What is the answer? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. So what is a faith? The Bible has the answer for what is a faith. So here the Hebrew writer says, Now faith is this. 
Faith is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen, and that is faith. So all the saints of God in the Old Testament live by faith. Amen. And they were not justified by the law, including Moses himself, who wrote the Torah, who is always considered as the, the father of the law, the father of the law, all right, whom the Israelite has already given the credit that he is our father because he is the father of the law, because we believe in the law of Moses, including Moses, amen, walked by faith and not by the law. He was not justified by the law, by the means of the law, he was justified by faith alone, amen. Let's turn, uh, look at it again. Starting with uh, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift. But verse 5. By faith, again, Enoch was translated that he should not see that. 6 and 7. By faith, Noah, it does not say by the law. Amen. Let's continue by verse 8. By faith, Abraham. Again, oh my God. Okay, even Abraham was justified not by the law, but by faith. Let's continue again. Okay, by uh, verse 11. It says again, through faith also Sarah herself received strength, conceived seed. Amen. Right? Look at it again. 13. These are all uh, died in faith, not having the promise. Promises, but having seen them from afar off. Look at it again. All right, you continue reading. It's all by faith, by faith, by faith. Now look at it again here in by uh, verse twenty-two, uh, uh, verse twenty. By faith, Isaac. Verse twenty-one. By faith, Jacob. Verse twenty-two. By faith, Joseph. Verse twenty-three. By faith, Moses also. Wow. Including Moses was not justified by the means of the law or by the Sabbath law. But he was justified by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. See? By faith, Moses. By faith again, Moses. Wow. Now, verse, look at verse uh, 25. By faith with uh, Moses, when he was uh, come to the years, refused to be called the son of the former daughter, choosing, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Wow. Is esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater richer than the treasures in his for he respect unto the recompense of the reward. That means by faith, even Moses esteemed. Amen. The reproach of Christ, greater than all the treasures in his Amen. So according to the Hebrews chapter 11, now you can see verse 24 and 25, you can see that the God of Moses is none other but Jesus Christ himself. Amen? How do we know? You can see that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26 say that even Moses was esteeming the reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ greater than all the treasures in the Ezekiel. Clear now? So therefore, as long as there is the, this, uh, the seventh seal, and if the seventh seal is not destroyed or lose, amen, and as long as that seventh seal continues to bound, binds the book, and as long as the, you know, if it is not taken out from the book, and it continues to seal that, that, that book, then there will be no salvation. So now let's come to the bottom line of this explanation. Why was John the Baptist, sorry, sorry John is uh, Apostle John. Why was John the Apostles wept much? Why did he say, I wept, I cried bitterly? That was the reason behind. Because he knew it. That there is nobody, not even Moses, not even Abraham, not even Eliza, Elisa, not even all the great prophets of God can give you redemption and salvation. And they don't have the power and their authority to remove the law, amen. Or to lose the seven seals, to take out, to lose the seven seals and to look upon the book and to open the book, amen. Open the book, amen. So here, open the book means to give salvation. Open the book 
means to give salvation to the mankind. Amen. Just like in the previous class, I talk about the heaven open. When the Bible says the heaven open, if I say heaven open means heaven open, there's nothing to that. บางคนคาริงฮันบางคนคาริงฮันดิฉันเองมาเรียนรู้แล้วอ๋อหมอบอกสิอ๋อหมอบางคนคาริงฮันบางคนคาริงฮันคุณจะพิเศษตัวนี
เชื่อว่าคนไม่มีพักงานเนี่ยการพูดเดี๋ยวนี้ก็ทุกคนเนี่ยนะครับประเทศทุกคนจบจบสุดแต่ก็ยังลงเรียนสลับมาเรียนสมรู้สิเมื่อเขาตั้งแต่ลงเรียนสลับมาตุยุ่งดังนั้นอ่ะพูดไม่เอ็นเจลเนี่ยอามาฮิจูดักดิวสิเกตนี่จะเป็นเพื่อนกันที่มาละอ่าฮะมาละก็ได้อ่ะเป็นคนอังกฤษเนี่ยเป็นคนกับผู้เก่งมากเลยอีสุอันนี้กันเนี่ยอะไรตัวเนี่ยอีสุคริสต์ต่างหันดุยเลือดเราเข้ามาตีเราบ้างเลยตัวบัดดุยเลือดเราเปลี่ยนทารกชวนนักอินฮาร์ดูข้าเปลี่ยนทารกตุยเตลเมลเราอินเปลี่ยนทารกเราบ้างข้าปูเสียงไงเลยก็เราบ้างคุยตุ๊กตาอะไรนู่นนะชั่วคราว if there is not if it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ is brought and if the the law keep on continuing then there will be no salvation and nobody is worthy Even the heaven and earth and under the earth, not even Moses, not even the saints of God, not even the prophets of God, nobody has the power to unloose the seven seal. Vara po le po le no ya po tu ba kha he le kha bo na na sin kha na to seri ka per chok tu le la chok tu le le kha bo ka hong thei po mu ba me ibu dong mo hong thei di chu. What does it mean to give salvation? To offend means. What to give salvation to who? To the nations, tongues, and languages. Hallelujah. But the law of Moses, even if it continues, he will never be able to give redemption and salvation because the purpose of the law is not to give salvation. No man is justified by the law. Then what was the purpose of the law and the Sabbath then? To bring the people to Christ. That's it. Amen. And therefore. On the contrary, Hallelujah, Christ ended the old covenant and established his new covenant, which is established upon a better promise. This Hallelujah, Amen. And therefore, he ended and gave a divorcement letter on the contrary when he said, "My God, My God, why has Thou forsaken me?" So, what did God forsaken? For eternity, that God has forsaken, because the old covenant has already fulfilled its promises and it's already fulfills its role. Now remember, the old covenant, the law of the Sabbath, has now already fulfilled its role, and therefore now it ceases to exist under the New Testament. Hallelujah! And therefore, under the New Testament, of all the country, okay, including the Jews. And the Gentile, no one is required to keep the Sabbath, and no one is required to keep the Sabbath or even do a physical circumcision. So now, to look at that, my friend, Sabbath is the night of Lord. Amen. So the next thing we will say, night of Lord. Amen. Now the next thing we will say, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can you now take a second? Pastor Park, so the next thing we will say, 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 the next thing we will say. บอกสาขาประเทศดาบบอกเชลดาประเทศดาบบอกเชลจุดมีเรื่องกันนี่อาเมนอาเลลูยาบอกสาขาดาบบอกเชลบอกบอกเชลตัวอาเลลูยาอาเลลูยาอาเมนอาบิสโวลฮีตุเมนีมิเทียมโลฮีเทมานีอาเอ็กกันไปเอลูเมเมเดมาจะกันชัวร์อะไรแต่การสั่งอินดิอินบอลลูตาอินทรีเมย์อาเลลูยาผมพูดที่ประเด็นเราบ้างส่วนลุงกันตีครับ Hey, apa yang kita cium tu? Kita di teleskop ada yang kita nampak tak? One more than one crore. Helai leh helai inkar ada di mana? Dan suin kar ada tin. Kamu teleskop dia tin lukan tak? Lung tengah kalung yang tu cuma. Cuma tangguh kan tin lain kat air cuma. Bukan kan orang cok tin tu tengah jam sama. Jadi apa? Cok tak cok. Cuma asyik lo beri beri lagi. Pati ada yang bawa asyik angcik kan bawa kau berada di sana. Tanah bawa cilok berapa? Hallelujah. Nanti berhenti dalam pati yang dah bawa cilok semua. Misuan berhenti yang lebih kei mana dah? Hallelujah. Cuma lagi suan itu hingga nak nak pihak terhad bawa hingga pihak terhad tu berapa? Hahaha. Hahaha. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jadi orang yang turun luar tu ni, setia setia orang ini. Bukan sah pun ini tu. Kebal pun orang ini tu, amen. So apa pun orang ini tu. Turun sah sah ni, tu tu ini tu, anda kata apa ini, anda tu tu ini tu, amal pun ini tu, amen. 
The second Corinthians that 3, the 7 to 11. Now here, please keep in memory that most of all, the contrasting between the old covenant and what? The new covenant. He contrasts between the old covenant and the new covenant. So now, let's check it out. What Paul, <coughs> what most of Paul says about the old covenant, the law, and the Amen. Testament. Let's read the second Corinthians. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. Amen. Now let's look at first in verse 11. It says, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remained is glorious. So now, what is that remained? That remained is the new covenant, my friend. And everybody knows that. The 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. Okay, that remitted, it's actually referring to the new covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The new covenant will remain forever. Hallelujah. And then what is that done away? Done away is the law of the Moses, the Sabbath, the old covenant has been done away. Hallelujah. And where and when did Christ is done away when he died on the country? Hallelujah. So Calvary at one. Hallelujah. And then he contrasts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. He says, The old covenant, the law of Moses, is that ministrations of death and the life. Number one, Apostle Paul says, So the law and the Sabbath was nothing but a ministrations of what? Death. Number one. Hallelujah. Number two, look at verse 9. Okay. The maximum is ministers on that. What is the minimum of the law of Moses? In the maximum way, it is a ministers on that. In a minimum way, it is a ministers of what? Condemnation. Him low, sanna. Him low, sandirna. Again, ha. Him low, sandirna. Tulung. Covenant means what? Tulung. Condemnation means what? Him low, sandirna. Ministration of death means what? He na wrong born na. See that? In a maximum way, the old covenant is nothing but ministration of death. In a minimum way, it's a ministration of condemnation. That means, as long as you continue, as long as you keep the law of Moses, the law of the Sabbath, then you will be condemned. Amen? You will never receive the righteousness and redemption and justification but you will be condemned for eternity. Number one, number two, because since the old covenant, the law of Moses is nothing but administrations of debt, you will not receive justification and salvation. As far as the Holy Scripture is concerned. And that's the reason why Zohar wept. Because Moses cannot remove the old covenant. Eliza cannot remove the, the old covenant. He cannot, you know, done away. In, uh, you know, the Sabbath and the law, even Moses cannot do that, even Abraham cannot do that, nobody can do that in heaven and earth and under it, only Christ can do it, hallelujah, amen, and there's a reason why Zohar said, I wept bitterly, because nobody is worthy in heaven, on earth and under the earth, to lose and to open the book, amen, hallelujah, and to read the book, amen, but there is only one man. But the angel of God said unto him, Now let's see the good news. The good news is this, my beloved friends. Okay? Check it out here in the Revelation chapter 5. The good news is this. The angel of God cried out unto him and said to John. Look at it in verse 
Okay, verse 5. He said, I wept much, or in other words, I wept bitterly because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book there, and neither to look thereon. And therefore, he said, I wept bitterly because of that. But the good news is this, my friend. Look at here in verse 5. One of the angels or one of the elders said unto me, one of the elders said unto me, to Zon, weep not, brother Zon, or in other words, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. So here is the comfort is coming from one of the elders. And one of the elders said unto John, the apostle, John, weep not, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, hallelujah, and who is also not the root of David. Now I said it this several times before. What does it mean by root of David? Now the root of David means he is the maker of David. He's the creator of David. He's the God of David. That's the meaning. Amen. He's the root of David. Remember, it does not say offsprings of David. It does not say ears of David. It says root of David. That means he is the God of David, the maker of David. Amen. That's the meaning of root. And then he said, lion from the tribe of Judah. Is Jesus Christ the real physical lion? No. But he, is he the real lion? Yes, he's the real lion. But what does the lion symbolize? Okay, but, uh, Tom Tom, read out. Tom and Tom. Genesis 49 verse 9. Quickly. Do you want to know that why is Jesus Christ known as lion? 49 verse 9. Amen. Lion. Known as the king of the jungle. Okay. So why is Jesus Christ a lion? I, Genesis 49 verse 9. What does it say? Genesis 49 verse Underline. 9. Uh -huh. Judah is a lion well. Uh -huh. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stood down. He called as a lion and as an old lion who shall roast him up. Everybody on the line. Judah is the lion's well. Amen. In other words, Judah to lion is a to me. You see that? This is called a metaphor. Okay? So why is Jesus known as a lion? Because he is born according to the flesh, he's the son of David. And according to the flesh, he's not a Gentile. He's a purely a Jewish man. Amen? And according to the flesh, Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and he's a Jewish man, and he's a Judah. Amen? And therefore, the scriptures say that Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Oh, okay, but, me, amen. but then, you see, you see this first physical, literal line? No, my friend, this is a metaphor, this is a symbolic, amen. This is only simple. Then why did Jesus Christ known as a lion? Because he is a Judah. Amen. Because according to the flesh, he is a Jewish. And the son of David, according to the flesh. According to the spirit, According to the spirit, he is, he is the God of David, but according to the flesh, he is the son of David. He is a purely a Jewish man. And therefore, John also says in John 1 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not. So, who are his own? The Jew, the Israelites. Therefore, not. So therefore it says, lion from the tribe of Judah. Now let's see the second one it says. Okay, root of David. I said this several times. Even though according to the flesh that Jesus may be the son of David, but according to the spirit, our God, Jesus, is also the God of David. Amen. And therefore he's known as the root of David. And to lose the seventh seal thereof, and to Take on the seventh seal. That means here, one of the elders assured and give the assurance to John. Said, John, did not stop you crying because I have brought you a good news. And the good news is this: that behold, 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the root of David, has prevailed to offend the book. He can offend the book. Amen. That means offend the book here means he can give salvation to all nations, tongues, and languages. Hallelujah. He can redeem. He can give salvation to Israelite, not through the Lord Moses, not through the Sabbath law, but through his gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. And that is the reason why before the ascension into heaven, that Jesus Christ gave the commissions to his disciples. Amen. Eleven of them are purely Jewish. And out of the eleven, one person is the Hellenistic Gentile. And who is his, what is his name? But Zion, who is that the Jews? And who is the one of the, the disciple of Jesus Christ is from the Gentile background? Who is that? Brother Leo. Among the twelve disciples, one person for Hellenistic is a, a Gentile background. And who is that? Among the twelve disciples, there is one man who's coming from the Gentile background. And who is that? Hellenistic. Gentile. Huh? Luke. Who said Luke? You. Amen. True. Amen. It's Luke only. Okay? Luke is coming from the Gentile background, but the rest of them are all Jews. And after this chosen one, the twelve disciples, that Jesus Christ gave the commission. And the commission is what? To preach what? Okay? To preach what? The law or the gospel? To preach now the gospel to every Creator. Amen. Now to preach the gospel to all nations because the Lord cannot give them salvation at all. The Sabbath can never give them salvation. They can keep it the Sabbath law for another 10,000 years, but they will never receive redemption. Only the gospel, the new covenant, can give them salvation. Only Jesus can give them salvation. Hallelujah. And therefore, let's conclude this class with Mark 16, verse 15. Let's read out together. Before the ascension, suppose the Calvary, after he's done away the old covenant, after when Christ has done away the old covenant, hallelujah, suppose the Calvary, that Jesus Christ appointed his disciples to come to the appointed mountain that is above Olive. And then he gave them this great commission, and after that he ascended into heaven, and he said unto them, Lo, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Hallelujah. I will continue to be with you, but go and teach and preach the gospel to every nation. And hereby we stand in that commission. And therefore, we as a seminary, ABTS, we are committed. Amen. And standing for that gospelization, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reach a man and women at any place. And this is the purpose of our existence, and this is the uh, the utmost purpose of ABT's existence. And therefore, we are here learning God's word so that we can be the gospel preacher, we can do the evangelism and save souls at any cost in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's read together Mark 16. Okay, now everybody turn back to the gospel of Ma uh, Matthew, gospel, uh, sorry, uh, Mark gospel, Mark chapter uh, 16, the gospel of Mark. Let's read together Mark 16 and verse 15 and 16. Okay, so we'll read together now. One, two, three. <coughs> and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 16. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believe not shall be damned. Amen. So he that believe on me will obey my words, and they will be baptized in my name, and they shall be saved. And that's what Jesus said. He that believe and baptize will be saved. Baptize in what name? In the name of Jesus, my friend. And therefore we call ourselves followers of Jesus. And therefore we proudly sing the hymn, the Christian hymn. And you say, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Hallelujah. Amen. Because only Jesus can save you and redeem you and sanctify you. Only he can give you that redemption. Only he can give you that justification and salvation for eternity. Amen. And hereby we stand in that pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the commission that we receive from our Lord Jesus Christ. And hereby we stand in that commission, in that gospel of Jesus Christ.
of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll start for today. Thank you so much for your precious time. We shall continue it tomorrow again to see more about it. Uh, the chapter 5 is something uh, very important one. So I would take another uh, the second part. We'll see the second part tomorrow. This is the first part. The second part shall be continued tomorrow. Let's see tomorrow. Uh, don't miss your class uh, so that you can learn uh, these things. And I know that in the days to come, that you are going to be used by the Lord here on this earth for His extent of His kingdom and for His glory. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let us sing with His name. Uh, you can bring that guitar or someone can play the keyboard so someone can come over here. And we'll sing that song. And Brother Tom Tom is going to pray for us. Brother Tom will come and pray for us after this song. Okay? Let us sing this song together. So we all rise up together for the glory of God. And uh, let's sing this song. I don't know if we have this. Uh, okay. Come on, let's play the